everyone. I'm Jensine Bard, and welcome to Testimony, where truth is told, lives are changed, and hope is given. Revelation 12:11 tells us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, a testimony of your story for His glory. He is a professor of mathematics emeritus at the University of Oxford, England, internationally renowned speaker, author, apologist, and debater of renowned atheists, some of which include Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Peter Singer. His books, which span the fields of science, philosophy, and religion, include God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God?, God and Stephen Hawking, Whose Design Is It Anyway?, Can Science Explain Everything?, Gunning for God, Why the New Atheists Are Missing the Target?, and Where is God in a Coronavirus World, just to name a few. And now, with his latest just released, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity, this legendary lecturer, Making the Case for Christ, promises to deliver even more. But that's not all, as you will soon hear in his just released documentary, Against the Tide, Finding God in an Age of Science, with actor-writer-producer Kevin Sorbo, both of which we will talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a high honor indeed, Dr. John Lennox. And Dr. Lennox, welcome to Testimony. Thank you very much indeed. Delighted to be part of your broadcast. Well, it is a complete honor to have you here, sir, with us today for testimony where truth is told, lives are changed, and hope is given, and where we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Revelation 12, 11. I also want to share the joy of having had the Gettys on my program in word and song, Keith Getty in testimony, and Kristen, his wife, and your niece singing the iconic In Christ Alone, as well as Kevin Sorbo of Hercules fame, whose tremendous work in faith-based films like God's Not Dead first kindled his interest in your tremendous work and writings, now culminating in the two of you collaborating for your must-see film due out in November against the tide, finding God in the age of science. So let's get right to it. First question, how did you, Dr. John Lennox, come to faith in Jesus Christ and then take us to the University of Cambridge in 1962, where you say you first heard the famed British writer, lay theologian, and iconic author of Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, give a lecture you would never forget. I grew up in the very small country of Northern Ireland, and my parents were very keen Christians, and they lived Christianity. And so from the very beginning, I saw Christianity at work, and I responded as a very young child to the message of the gospel, trusted Christ very simply, and then, of course, developed because my parents not only opened the world of the Bible to me, but they taught me to think about other worldviews as well. And uh, my father, in particular, introduced me to the writings of C.S. Lewis, and they were an enormous help in developing my conviction that the Christian faith is true, it's rational, it's logical, and it can stand up to all kinds of opposition. And that was a wonderful preparation for going to Cambridge in 1962. And I knew that Lewis was there. I didn't realize he was dying. But he gave his last lectures in the Christmas term in 1962. And I discovered that the lecture theater where he was lecturing was just across the road from the Mathematics Institute. And so on several occasions, I, I'm i afraid I skipped out of the maths lectures that I went to hear Lewis. And I'm so glad I did, because 
it wasn't so much the content of the lecture I remembered. It was about John Donne. And it was masterly, of course. His command of the English language was just magnificent. And he didn't hesitate to give little gems of information about his own Christian commitment. But, you know, the thing that I remember most is the way it was done. It was very cold. He burst into the lecture theater wearing a very heavy coat, a hat, and a scarf. And he picked his way through the hundreds of students who were sitting not only on desks, but on the floor and in the windows, and slowly divested himself of his garments, lecturing all the time. So that by the time he was at the podium, you'd heard four or five minutes of a brilliant lecture. And so he went on for 50 minutes, and then he reversed the process, which is very amusing. He kept lecturing while he put on his hat, his scarf, his coat, and uttered the last words as he burst out through the double doors. And in the film I've made with Kevin Sorbo, we reenact that scene in the very same lecture room in Cambridge. So it, it's part of the nostalgia of the film that brings me back to those very important days in my life. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Dr. John Lennox. Uh, Dr. Lennox, there is a famous pub called, quote, The Eagle and Child, end quote, where you and Kevin Sorbo meet in the film Against the Tide to discuss its significance and the plaque displayed on one of its walls, and I quote, C.S. Lewis, his brother, W.H. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, and other friends met every Tuesday morning between the years 1939 to 1962 in the back room of their favorite pub. These men, popularly known as, quote, the Inklings, met here to drink beer and to discuss, among other things, the books they were writing. Dr. Lennox, can you elaborate? And then, is this where the term, you don't have a, quote, inkling, comes from? Yes. <laughs> uh, the term inkling, I think, existed beforehand. Uh, it was Lewis's name for the group. He used an existing term, so far as I recall, and they met in the eagle and child. Unfortunately, although I'm old now, I'm far too uh, young to have been part of that. But it's very atmospheric, and it was a very suitable place for me to start my discussion with Kevin in the city of Oxford and the university where I work. Now, actor Kevin Sorbo does a great job of narrating the film with you as the featured guest as you both journey across the world in making the case for Christianity versus atheism. Talk about some of the places you visited in the film Against the Tide and why. Well, there are three places involved in the film, essentially. The first is the city of Oxford, and uh, Kevin and I go round Oxford in various settings, including my own iconic college, Green Templeton College, where he talks to me about, in the observatory actually, it's an old observatory building, he talks to me about cosmology and the beginning of the universe. And I agree with you, he was a brilliant discussion partner because he understood the stuff, he's committed in his own mind uh, to the Christian worldview. And it was a sheer delight to work with him. We then moved briefly to Cambridge, where, uh, as I said, we reenacted the scene uh, in the English faculty lecture rooms and visited my old college, Emmanuel College, Cambridge. But the second half of the film, we go to Israel. And you asked me, why do we go to these places? Well, of course, the first two, obviously, they are the universities where I was educated and where I now work. But going to Israel is in response to a very important question that always arises when you discuss God and science. The response of many people in my lectures and so on is to say, but look, it's all very well to talk about evidence uh, for God in the natural world given to us by science, but you're a Christian. And that's special. That relates to what happened 20 centuries ago in the Middle East. 
And so for the second half of the film, Kevin and I go to Israel, where it all began, in order to tease out the evidence for the truth of the specific Christian claims to talk about the reliability of the documents we have, the Gospels, to visit the places where Jesus worked and uh, where the disciples witnessed to the world. And of course, to spend time in Jerusalem, where he did many miracles, but also was tried, crucified, and where he rose again. So those were very atmospheric and very interesting places to visit in Kevin's company. And we ended up in Galilee, where, of course, Jesus eventually met the disciples after his resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to internationally renowned author, speaker, and apologist, Dr. John Lennox. Uh, Dr. Lennox, what, in your view, is irrefutable proof that Jesus exists and will return again to claim his own. And two, how has debating world-renowned atheists helped to reinforce what you already believe as a Christian? Can you expound? Well, those are three very big questions. <laughs> Take them briefly one by one. First of all, the question of Jesus' existence that's a question for ancient historians. And the amazing thing is there's virtual unanimity among them. Not only that Jesus actually existed, but that many of the things recorded in the Gospels about him are seen to be historically reliable. Now, when I speak of ancient historians, they're not all believers. Many of them are atheists and some agnostics, but they feel that the historical evidence is strong enough to accept um, the things that Jesus claimed to have done. And we, we discuss these in the film. And of course, that begins to give us authentication for Jesus' own claims. And his claim to be the Son of God, who came into this world and will one day return, of course, critically goes back to the question of the resurrection. And in Jerusalem, Kevin and I discussed the question of the evidence for the resurrection. Why should we believe that this is a historical event that actually took place? So we look at the historical evidence, and then, of course, we consider the evidence of the way in which people who respond to Christ and trust him have their lives transformed by him. And that provides additional evidence that he is not only rose from the dead in the past, but he is alive today. And it all adds up to a cumulative story which puts the whole business right firmly in the space of things that one can credibly believe and trust on. But of course, when we get that far, there still is the step of our own personal commitment to Christ. But it's an evidence-based commitment. And that's what's so important to me in this film and in my books, to establish that Christianity is not irrational. It's a rational, evidence-based faith that uh, we are thinking about, and we can be have strong reasons, grounds for believing that it is true. So we took all those aspects in as we moved around Israel. And you do that, and magnificently. So I'd like to read a couple of quotes from, I believe, atheists, and your response that opens up the movie against the tide. Quote, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. It is not necessary to invoke God. Professor Stephen Hawking, University of Cambridge. Next one. Quote, you are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells. End quote. Francis Crick, co-discoverer of DNA, and then your response, quote, the universe is best explained by the existence of a purposeful creator, 
All competing claims lack explanatory power. Professor John Lennox, University of Oxford. Question. How easy or difficult has it been for you to explain your ideology, your theocracy, to the atheists that you are renowned for debating? (laughs) Well, of course, you need to ask them (laughs) about that question. But I've been thinking about these questions all of my life, and I think that people will agree that I take the atheist arguments seriously. I believe that there are credible answers to them. Unfortunately, uh, some of their arguments are sheer nonsense, like the first one you quoted. The universe can and will create itself from nothing. Well, the idea of something creating itself is is actual nonsense. Uh, To create something from nothing, for something to create itself, it must already be in existence. And therefore, that's just a flat contradiction. And the sad thing is, I find that some of these people who are brilliant scientists, when they step outside of science, as I frequently do, so I must be on my guard, they do talk nonsense about these things. But what I'm hoping in my debates with the atheists is that I'm reaching thousands of people out there who are interested in credible answers to these questions. And what has encouraged me over the years is the stream of people who have become Christians through watching those debates. That's what encourages me, that the arguments actually have traction, and in spite of the noise from the atheists, the arguments are getting across. Amen and amen. Now, in watching Against the Tide, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Dr. John Lennox, you say you went behind the Iron Curtain to actually address or talk with people that had a totally different view than yours, and this is something you have done all your life. You have an affinity for languages, uh, and the doors that opened because of that. Can you explain? Well, the, the point is that I've always been interested in worldviews opposite to my own. So atheism is the polar opposite. And I got the opportunity when I was a research uh, scientist to go to Germany and learn the language. And I was then invited to, to come in behind the Iron Curtain in 1976. And from 76 to 89, I went regularly, mostly to encourage Christian believers because there were very few people like me there, because education wasn't always open to people who openly confessed Christ. So I wanted to encourage them. And when the wall came down in 89, I started going to Russia and Ukraine. And it was just fascinating to see atheism actually at work in its expression as a Marxist ideology. And I could see the damage it did to people And it was a a great training ground for me, in a way, to meet people like Richard Dawkins and so on in in later life. But that was, for me, a very rich experience. We tried to sketch just a little bit of it and give the flavor of it. It was wonderful to hear about that. Now, you say in the movie Against the Tide that you read all of C.S. Lewis's books before landing at Cambridge University to study mathematics Uh, made possible by the belief of one headmaster who saw the potential and gifting, and you so questioned, Dr. Lennox, would you have chosen this field without the encouragement of this headmaster? And if not, what field would you have chosen and why? Well, I was interested early on in languages, Latin first, but then Uh, other languages, but I had very good mathematics teachers. And these things often depend on the quality of your teachers. And my headmaster was a good mathematician. I was actually slated to go to university having won a scholarship very young to do electrical engineering Mm. because another of the things that was interesting to me at that time was being a ham radio operator. And that's one of the ways I learned the German language. But the headmaster said, look, I think you might have the potential to go to Cambridge. But 
our school, the high quality of teaching in chemistry and physics, you would need to do engineering. But we could do it in mathematics as I teach you myself because he had been at Cambridge. And so I decided to go for mathematics. I got advice from someone we knew, an outstanding Christian who became a mentor, lifelong friend, Professor David Gooding. And he said, look, if you can get in, go for it. So I went for it and I was very blessed to get in. Of course, it completely changed my life. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you're listening to Professor Emeritus, University of Oxford, England, Dr. John Lennox, an author of his latest, just released, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity, which we will touch on shortly. Question, Dr. Lennox. Had the renowned atheists you've debated read the Bible? And if not, why not? And how, in your view, can they be, quote, scientific without all of the information they are seeking to refute? Well, it it varies, and it's very difficult to second-guess what people have read. Uh, Richard Dawkins and others call themselves cultural Christians, and they say that the Bible is very important as literature because in the history of the English language it plays a a great role, and, and that's very good. But, for instance, when I debated Peter Singer, uh, he made certain statements about the Bible, and it was clear he hadn't read it carefully. So I find uh, a a great variety of response. And you're quite right. It, It troubles me because I take care to read very carefully what atheists say. But it's rather sad when they won't even listen or read the basis for my own worldview, which is is Christian. But that's the battle we're in. One just has to deal with that. I try to get across, of course, to people the credibility of what the Bible does say, which I've done in many books now. But it it is a real battle. People will say they don't believe, but they don't know what it is they're not believing. They, <laughs> they don't know what it is they're rejecting. Exactly. I have so many questions for you and so little remaining time. Um, In Isaiah 55, 11, we read, quote, that God's word does not come back void, end quote. That said, has there ever been a time, Dr. Lennox, when simply using the word of God, when sharing with an atheist, an unbeliever, an undecided, pricks their heart to repentance and salvation? Well, sure, of course. If that didn't happen, I wouldn't be talking to you now. (laughs) I think it's it's very important that our confidence is actually in the Word of God and in Scripture. And it saddens me when in the church these days there's such a loss of confidence in Scripture. That's why, by the way, I've written a couple of books just on Scripture, one on the prophet Daniel, against the flow, not against the tide, against the flow, and one about the life of Joseph, because I feel it's so important to get Scripture across. And in the end, it is the most important thing to leave people with Scripture responding to that, rather than simply responding to what I say and my arguments, although both are important. In our remaining time here today, talk about your recently released 2084 Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. Dr. Lennox. Well, this question about artificial intelligence is something that I was being asked by many Christians, but by other people. And I wrote the book to try to introduce them to what is going on and to differentiate between what is actually happening and then all the science fiction type hype of creating super intelligences. And briefly, the story is that AI has two very different aspects. The first is narrow AI, and we're using that all the time in our smartphones in searching for a vaccine for COVID-19. We're using uh, AI in facial recognition which is a plus side, recognizing criminals and terrorists in crowds. 
but also has a downside in that it can be used and is being used to suppress people groups like the Uyghurs in China. And so the AI that's actually working, it's like a very sharp knife. A knife can be used for surgery or it can be used for murder. And so I'm encouraging bright Christians who are interested in science to get involved in the plus side of this because they could be using AI to help with diseases like Rosalind Pickard, a wonderful Christian professor at MIT who deals with autistic children. And we need Christian people who understand this stuff so that they can talk and warn us about the downside. The the second aspect of artificial intelligence is artificial general intelligence. And the idea there is to try to create a superhuman intelligence, either by enhancing existing human minds, by biological engineering and implants and that kind of thing, or by starting from scratch and building an intelligence based not on organic material but on silicon. And what I say in the book that this is taken seriously by many people, there are best-selling books by folks like Yuval Noah Harari, a book called Homo Deus, where he seriously talks about us turning people into gods. And of course, this is very important because the danger with this kind of activity is it's redefining what it means to be a human being. And therefore, I discuss very important things in the book about what scripture has to say about the meaning of human beings and what it has to say about the future. And uh, that's something that would require a whole separate interview. But I'm very encouraged by the response to this book from all over the world. It's available now on Kindle and uh, everything else. 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to internationally renowned speaker, author, apologist, and professor emeritus of mathematics, University of Oxford, Dr. John Lennox, whose latest just released, Against the Tide, Finding God in an Age of Science, is a must-see. You can learn more about Dr. Lennox's work, ministry, and mission by visiting John Lennox. Dot .org and get informed, get his book, support his work, and then go see Against the Tide at againstthetide.movie. You will be exceedingly blessed that you did. Dr. Lennox, thank you for taking precious time to share just a little of your amazing journey, clearly God-directed and called and clearly for such a time as this, your legendary debates with renowned atheists, proving fact over fiction, faith over fear, and just plain common sense over idiocy and ignorance is a gift to us all from Oxford to Israel and beyond your latest eye-opening documentary, Against the Tide, with actor, writer, and producer Kevin Sorbo makes the case and brilliantly so. We thank you, and God bless you. C.S. Lewis would be proud. Thank you very much indeed. Testimony is a global broadcast made possible by the generous contributions of our valued partners at Jensen Bard Ministries and you, our listening audience. Together, we are reaching souls for Christ one testimony at a time. If you would like information on how you can support this broadcast with your tax-deductible gift, please visit us at jensenbard.com. That's one word, J-E-N-S-I-N-E-B-A-R-D.com. And join the conversation at our Facebook page, Testimony with Jensen Bard. Thank you for listening, and please join us again for Testimony. Testimony.